One year ago, at the end of October, I was giving a talk to a group of students at NUIG, and one of them asked whether I took gender into account when deciding what plays to produce. I answered honestly that I did not. I wouldn't say that now. Two days later, Lian Bell pressed send, and all hell broke loose. <laughs> Two weeks after that, we were standing on the stage, raising our voices in bewilderment and anger and frustration. What a difference a year makes. One thing I've learned over the past tumultuous year is that it doesn't matter how much of a right-thinking, left-leaning, liberal, card-carrying feminist you are. In a sector we like to think is open and progressive, it's a shock to realize that you were part of the problem. But one thing I know, if you're part of the problem, you can be part of the solution. Of course, that doesn't mean turning our back on the creative relationships we already have. But for every producer and director and artistic director and programmer and curator amongst us, for anyone who has any influence in what sort of stories make it to the stage and who gets to tell those stories on that stage, and that goes for the funders too, it means being open to new collaborators, it means not making the usual assumptions, it means counting the numbers, it means looking up. One thing is for sure. Irish theatre is a better, more equal place than it was a year ago. And we're only getting started. One thing that lit the fire under all of us last year was shock. The shock at hearing stories of exclusion from colleagues from respected and deeply talented and intelligent women. Shock that I hadn't noticed that I hadn't seen them in a while. And shock at hearing firsthand just how many movements for change had swelled in the past only to ebb back into obscurity. We just stopped noticing. So now my one thing is I'm gonna notice. On a positive note, I've had a year of extraordinary women Derv Lacrotti's Juno at the Gate, Ashing O'Sullivan's Vera here at the Abbey, directed by Annabel Cummin, embodied in the GPO, Grace Jones with Sophie Fine, Zia Holly, and Katie Holly. I worked with set designer Marie Cairns on Invitation to a Journey, a long overdue homage to the extraordinary Eileen Gray, who despite being one of the most innovative, multidisciplinary, inventive, and breathtakingly beautiful artists and designers of the 20th century, all but disappeared into obscurity until relatively recently. She did not stop working. She was designing right up until the end. She just failed to be noticed. But looking at it again, I worked with three female directors in 2016. That is one quarter of all the directors I worked with. I worked with four female set designers out of nine in 2016. In the past two years, no chief electrician I worked with was female. No sound designer or composer was female. No production manager was female, except for one in a production in the UK. Costume was overwhelmingly female unless the designer was designing the set. So now I notice, and when I come to balance my end of year accounts, I now have a new folder in my accounts file entitled Gender Balance. In 2013, I started to count the women reviewed in the books pages of the newspapers, and then I stopped counting three weeks in. The figures were abysmal. I said nothing or nothing in public. I noticed the male-only history of publicly funded programs like One City, One Book, and I moved swiftly on. I thought there was no point talking even very loudly to people who cannot hear. I was proud and delighted to be appointed laureate for Irish uh, fiction in 2015, but even then, even then, I couldn't do the whole woman thing. I couldn't be a woman writer, labelled, dismissed, ghettoised, sometimes shamed or derided, rendered unimportant. I couldn't be that thing, not even for Ireland, <laughs> not even for you. Waking the Feminists gave me my politics back. 
It has opened casual or urgent conversations with literary editors and arts curators, festival managers, selection committees. Some of them are in a state of denial. Some are actually hurt to have the numbers pointed out to them, but more of them are not. These are not bad people. It would be nice to know what they're thinking when they practice unwitting discrimination, but the fact is they're not thinking at all. And that's no longer possible, thanks to you. Before I begin my remarks to you, there's some housekeeping items I need to share with you. The duration of the event will be two hours straight through. Please don't leave anything in the aisles. Keep your phones on silent, but do tweet using the hashtag WTF one thing. In terms of the format of the meeting, there'll be a number of speakers, the presentation of headline research, and a video or two. There'll be no Q&A at the end, but there will be boxes in the foyer afterwards with cards for everyone to fill out their one thing. Free sheets with the headline research will be handed out as people leave the auditorium, so there's no need to take notes. You can give your full attention to the speakers. Also at the end, there will be a bucket collection to raise funds to support the activities of Waking the Feminists, as well as lots of great merchandise for the same reason, including badges and bags and limited edition prints of the iconic photo by Fiona Morgan uh, of the crowd with the banner last year. It's a great privilege for me to be invited here today to help you celebrate and reflect on an extraordinary year in the history of Irish women. When you first gathered here a year ago, you were protesting an obvious gender imbalance in the 2016 program for the National Theatre. The testimonies given from the stage that day highlighted gender discrimination in the theatre and much further afield. Society was in the dock as much as theatre was. That day and what has happened since are part of a great tradition of Irish feminism, which begins as an ideology in the 1820s with Anna Wheeler's and William Thompson's wonderfully titled An Appeal of One Half of the Human Race, Women, Against the Pretensions of the Other Half, Men, <laughs> to retain them in political and hence in civil and domestic slavery. That clarion call led to the long battle for female suffrage, which eventually won us the right to that most fundamental guarantee of equality, the vote, partially in 1918 and fully in 1922. The campaign for female suffrage took two forms. First, the peaceful struggle for reform, exemplified by the parliamentary lobbying and patient bill writing of people like Isabella Todd, a Presbyterian from Belfast, and Anna Haslam, a Quaker from Yall, both staunch unionists, who pegged away at the tedious but necessary work of research, legislation, and alliance building. The second strand comes later and is more activist and noisy. Hannah Sheehy Skeffington's Irish Women's Franchise League, founded in 1908, produced a groundbreaking newspaper, The Irish Citizen, and focused on many other issues besides the franchise, women's right to education, to decent treatment in prison, to equality in their households, among many other things. The IWFL engaged in some genteel window breaking using toffee hammers, not the most effective weapon for the purpose, and they were imprisoned for their efforts. Their unionist sisters in the north were far more violent, bombing, burning, destroying mail, and cutting telephone wires. They were also very fond of digging up golf courses, which some might say was a service to humanity at large. <laughs> the vote was partially granted to women in 1918 and fully in the Irish Free State in 1922. Then the long backlash began with repressive legislation, forcing women off juries, preventing them from working in certain sectors, outlawing contraception and divorce, and imposing a marriage bar to employment. The 1937 Constitution privileged the concept of the woman in the home, although it did nothing to help her economically. Many valiant women, like Hilda Tweedy and Andrew Sheehy Skeffington, kept the flag flying for feminism during these dark years. But many women internalized the state's vision of their limitations and supported their own oppression. And in case we think that day is gone, contemplate with dismay the large number of women who voted for a known sexist and misogynist in the US last Tuesday. The second wave of Irish feminism comes in the late 60s following the publication of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, the book which blew open the concept of the contented housewife. Again, there were two strands, the legislative report writing politically astute activities of the Commission on the Status of Women and the flamboyant activism of the Irish women's liberation movement exemplified by the contraceptive train to Belfast in 1971. 
Both sides, the restrained and the noisy, had crucial parts to play in changing a culture which at that stage was unprepared for such ideas. Both sides achieved the great leaps forward exemplified by legislation on equal pay, deserted wives and unmarried mothers' allowances, proper widows' pensions, limited contraception, and the extraordinary number of important women's organizations set up in the 1970s, from the Rape Crisis Center to Cherish to the Well Woman Clinics and Women's Aid. The terrible reproductive wars of the 1980s gave us the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which has caused nothing but trouble, and eventually divorce, which has not resulted in floodgates bursting open as predicted by its opponents. There is much left to do, especially repeal of the Eighth Amendment and genuine economic empowerment for poorer women in our society. Your movement, Waking the Feminists, has been like a breath of fresh air blowing through our still very patriarchal society. In your approach and methodology, you have united the noisy and restrained strands of the previous waves of feminism. While the extraordinary event last year created all the right kinds of noise, it was succeeded by quality research, which would be essential for any real change to occur in theatre with regard to commissioning and employment of women. And you have created a template for the rest of the feminist movement to follow. Beautiful noise and super smart evidence-based findings. Be proud. What you started will echo into the future and take its place in the illustrious history of Irish feminism. last November, a group of us took a mandate from the hurricane of energy that you unleashed, and we made the commitment to throw ourselves into this campaign for one year. We said one year because, frankly, the scale of the mountain we saw ahead of us scared the crap out of us. <laughs> because our energy was already depleted in those first whirlwind weeks, and none of us relished the idea of becoming long-term campaigners. Speaking for myself, all I really wanted to do was make art and get on with my life my nice, quiet, behind-the-scenes life. <laughs> Reading back over some of the social media from this time last year, I found a post from another behind-the-scenes woman, costume designer Joan O'Cleary, which simply said, if not now, when? If not me, who? That decision to run Waking the Feminists for a year was, without realizing it at the time, one of the smartest things we did. It felt like a realistic commitment, so we weren't overwhelmed before we even started. It put a fire under us as we pushed as hard as possible for what we believe is right, and it put the skids on those around us. Things moved fast, never quite fast enough for my endless impatience, but to be fair to us, some very good things happened this year. Our National Theatre announced guiding principles on gender equality that set a national and international standard placing the Abbey and Ireland at the forefront of gender equality in theatre. We saw the arrival of two new directors here who no doubt will be working hard to turn those aspirations into reality. We'd like to thank them and all the staff of the Abbey for helping us to put this event on today. A core Waking the Feminists team member, Sarah Durkin, was appointed to the Abbey board, putting her extensive experience and passion at the direct service of our national theatre. The theatre landscape itself is changing. As well as the new directors here, there's been an appointment of a woman for the first time as the artistic director of our second highest publicly funded theatre, The Gate. And that wasn't something that was on the cards this time last November. The Arts Council invested money for research into gender balance in theatre, meaning that the personal testimony so many of you shared will now be backed up by hard numbers. Change from now on will be measurable. Our work has been recognised and backed by both the Community Foundation for Ireland and the Ireland 2016 Centenary Programme, who we thank for their generous support. The campaign itself has had a ripple effect into other areas of society, it's gained international recognition and won a number of awards. We and you put on some great events from London to Limerick, from Brooklyn to Inishir. Waking the Feminists has become a byword for successful grassroots campaigning. 
Most importantly, though, we've all felt a sea change in our community. We ourselves are not the same as we were. I think back to this time last year when speaking up, proclaiming our opinions and telling our personal stories felt for some of us dangerous. That we might lose too much. This year, and particularly this week, it feels even more important that we lose too much if we stay silent. Before Waking the Feminists, I'd never really spoken in public. I was, let me say it again, very much a behind the scenes person. Now I've spoken publicly for the campaign, I think about 25 times, from the Board Gosh Energy Theatre to seminar rooms in universities across the country, not counting the interviews I've done for radio, television, podcasts, and print media. As a girl who dreaded being called on to answer a question in class, I've been surprised to notice my palms don't sweat the same way they used to. I've watched women around me gaining confidence. I've seen them growing less afraid. I've seen and felt what happens when you're encouraged and supported and what happens when you're listened to. The one thing that stands out from this year for me is women, speak up. Use your voice to stick up for yourself and use it to stick up for those who are silent or silenced. Over the coming weeks, the public campaign will wind down and the Waking the Feminist social media channel channels will fall silent. But that does not mean that we, or you, can stop shouting for the things we believe in. Each of us is responsible for embedding what we've learned this year into our hearts and into our actions forever. Each of you. Particular responsibility lies on those of you who are in positions of power and influence, from funders to leaders of organizations, programmers, and artists who will make wonderful new work on this stage and stages across the country and the world in the years to come. Speak up, if not you, who? If not now, when? Good morning. My name is Neil Murray, and this is Graham McLaren. <laughs> uh, we are the directors of the Abbey Theatre. It is a great privilege for us to be given this opportunity to welcome you to your national theatre, and, and a chance to congratulate Waking the Feminists for putting the issue of gender equality right at the heart of Ireland's theatre community. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, last July, it seems much longer than that, <laughs> we announced our appointment to the Abbey Theatre with what we hoped would be a clear message, that regardless of your gender, your race, your accent, your physical abilities, or the money in your pocket, the Abbey is your national theatre, and we are here to tell your stories. Three months ago, the Abbey Theatre announced our eight guiding principles for gender equality, and we regard this as a good start but also know, that we need to, also know that we need to do much, much more. Not just the Abbey, but everyone in this room. Everyone currently watching online, everyone reading reports of this meeting. We need to find the many different ways to translate words into action. It is with that in mind that we would like to make an explicit appeal to you all now. That appeal is this. If you are a playwright, we want to hear your ideas. And no, it doesn't have to always fit a six-week run here on this stage or a one-week run downstairs or in any of the theatres in Ireland. It has to be urgent and important to you. So if you are a director or a lighting designer, if you're a choreographer or a dramaturg, an actor or a musician, we want to hear your urgent ideas. We want to support your passion for your work, regardless of where you think it might fit. Because we must remember this, that this theatre and these theatres that, that we all have, we, they are there to serve us. We are not there to serve them. And it's together, therefore, that we will transform your national theatre. Thank you.
Hello. I just want to start by saying that I have been extremely fortunate with the people I've worked with in my short career so far. The majority of work that I have done has been female driven, female writers, directors, producers. But working on a film like A Day for Mad Mary, surrounded by women, gave me fire in my belly about making fun, exciting work about women whose stories haven't been seen much before. But in saying that, this film was written by two brothers, Colin and Darren Thornton, which made it even better because it was a group of people of mixed gender telling a story about females without the male gaze. That's G-A-Z-E. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In my theatre work, I've been very fortunate to work with men that see women as equals, who recognise that we are real, three-dimensional human beings. When I first heard Awaken the Feminist, I was like, uh, yeah, I'm up, I'm awake, I've been awake for ages. But as the movement went on, I began to ask myself, what difference am I making to bring about the changes I want to see? And I realised it begins with looking at yourself. The key thing for any creative person is to find their voice. And I've been told over the years that I'm not very good at telling stories, that I go off on too many tangents. And I used to believe that because I wasn't what you'd call a great storyteller, I shouldn't even bother telling my stories at all. But then I realized that is just how I tell stories. Multiple storylines running simultaneously with multiple plots sounds like a great and complex narrative to me. And it's my voice. Of course, it's not a gender-specific thing, finding your voice, but why from a young age do girls stop being equal in numbers to boys in sport, in debating, in playwriting, etc.? We need to show young people of all genders that their stories, just like mine, like everybody's, are important, so they don't have to try find their voice. They already know it and they're not afraid to speak with it. It's not that I was ever discouraged from telling my stories, but somewhere along the line, I felt that they were invalid. Even writing this short piece, this short piece I wonder, am I saying something that's relevant? Is my voice valid? So the Wake in the Feminist Movement has reinforced that yes, it is, not just for me, but for women working in the industry everywhere. Thank you. Hello, um, this morning I want to talk to you about the requirement for active feminism today. But before I do that, I'm going to repeat myself um, in relation to women at work. In 1894, the Royal Commission on Labour published a report on the condition of women's work in Ireland. The three top issues identified for women at work at that time were childcare, low pay and length of day. So 2016 and the top three issues for women at work are still childcare, low pay and length of day. So 122 years later, women are still struggling with these issues. So we need something different. We need a strong feminist movement in Ireland and it is important that we understand and make others understand exactly what that is. Feminism is not about women disliking men. It's not about women replacing men or wanting to be treated like men. Feminism is about equality of opportunity for women and equality of access for women. Femini in September, um, I met the founder of the Swedish political party, a Feminist Initiative. This party have won a seat in the European Parliament and are traveling around Europe now to try to organize feminists so as to win speaking rights in the Parliament in 2019. So the one specific thing that I commit to here today is to contribute to the growth um, and development of equality for women on this island uh, is to forge strong Euro links with our European sisters. I will commit to attending their meeting in December where they are bringing together women who have met throughout the EU, who they have met throughout the EU, so that the feminist movement can be stronger together. But the key message here today, particularly when we look at what's happening across the Atlantic, is that we all understand that feminism is not just for women. Feminism is for everybody. Thank you. We live in an unequal society. The gender inequality that we have highlighted this past year is mirrored in many aspects of our lives, like the 14% gender pay gap. At current rates, by the time this is closed, I'll be 228 years old. <laughs> I've spent my entire life fighting injustice and inequality. As a production manager and designer, I've been up close and personal with a bucket load of misogyny. I spend a fair bit of time thinking about it, getting annoyed 
that for a live event production management award, there are 72 nominees and only six of them are women. Getting angry that women technicians I know have left the industry because they can't juggle the uncertain lifestyle, long hours and a decent home life. So what to do? A lot of my time is spent solving problems as they arise. Is there anything we can do to solve this problem? One thing is to watch our language. The words we use can reinforce preconceptions and validate discrimination. If you hear Irish rugby team beats New Zealand, do you feel the same as Irish women's rugby team beats New Zealand? If you don't, then that's on you. Take the time to think about what you say and how you say it. Small wonder there are so few female sound engineers when the generic term is noise boys, or big girls blouse used to describe a non-performing male. In my job, I've been called bossy, hard-nosed, and a few other things. <laughs> and my personal favorite, sure you're as good as any man. A use of words unlikely to be applied to my male counterparts. 62 million girls all over the world are denied access to an education. We are a highly educated sector. Let's use that education to make this change. I'll say it again, watch what you say. Let us redefine the world we live in with the language we use. Words matter. Hi, I'm Yasmin Akram. Um, what I'm committed to in terms of gender equality is that I want to create roles for women and I want to play roles myself that show all of our idiotic ways, our disgusting ways, our deeply, deeply flawed ways um, as human beings. I just, it still depresses me in this day and age that a lot of the time I see on television and, and I've been in and auditioned for many different roles where women have the answers or are the mature ones or are the ones with no personality and it's not right and it's not true and I think that we all want to live in a world where we're represented truly um, not just idealised versions that we can never ever hope to be so that's what I'm going to do make really really flawed women either play them or write them and I know everyone will enjoy that Hello. At Fish Amble, we've always considered that we develop and produce a programme of new work in an open, inclusive way to bring a range of voices to the stage. But Waking the Feminists has caused us to look more closely over the past year at our facts and figures, particularly with regard to gender. More women than men take part in our playwriting courses and are supported through our new play clinic initiative. More women send plays to our projects which call for submissions directly from the public. And more women have been awarded the Fishamble New Writing Award over the past 11 years at the Dublin Fringe Festival. However, when you look at figures for the unsolicited plays submitted to Fishamble, it works out at about three quarters from men and one quarter from women. And about a third of the plays that we've produced are by women, while two thirds are written by men. So we can see that our output over time is not as balanced as we would like it to be. One thing we've done is put in place some small, but we hope effective measures to try and address this, which have already created some results. So we've set up a subcommittee on our board to keep track of gender balance developments. We've employed a senior reader, Sarah Hoover, to give a gender blind reading of every play under consideration for advanced development and possible production. For our current year long director and playwright mentoring programme in association with Bell Table, we assessed applications with names omitted, so gender was unknown, and 16 participants are female and eight are male. And with our partners at Tiger Dublin Fringe and Irish Theatre Institute, we realised that our Show in a Bag initiative was attracting and supporting more male than female artists over the past eight years. So we made a commitment to a better balanced programme. We actively encouraged female artists to apply, and Dublin Fringe provided a female led workshop. This year, the gender balance shifted with twice as many female artists involved as male artists. We're committed to ensuring that these measures and more are not isolated events, but continue in the future, so that Fish Amble expresses the voice of a range of playwrights, including gender balance for our audiences. Thank you very much. Hi. 
Before I started producing shows in Ireland, for nearly 10 years, I worked as a theater critic in Poland. And today I would like to tell you about a very tricky discussion that has been happening there for a while. And to give you some context, Polish theater is madly political, male-dominated, and absolutely hardcore. And I'm talking four to seven hours of blood, semen, sex, and existential drama on stage. <laughs> and at some point, this political, mad, male-dominated theater found itself a new mission. Let's defend the female cause. And how do we do that? By showing graphically how brutalized and victimized the women are. And so it started. Hamlet wiping the floor with Ophelia, Petruccio brutally raping Katerina, German soldiers torturing female resistance fighters, communist militia clubbing protesting nurses, spotlight on misogyny, a parade of men who hate women, never-ending reenactments of rapes, murders, and beatings. Actresses in Poland became experts in being spectacularly, dramatically hurt. They would lie on stage covered in all kinds of fluids, broken and abused by patriarchy, church, capitalism, new media, the list is long. And when this practice became mainstream, feminists in Poland said, please, please stop defending us. <laughs> repeating, the gest repeating the gesture of abuse doesn't erase it. There's a fine line between criticizing something, making it visible, and between perpetuating and normalizing it. A broken woman on stage is a powerful image that can trigger discussions, but it becomes dangerous when it turns into a trend, a shortcut, a special effect. And no matter how seemingly consensual, female performers were forced to enact this abuse or be fired. And as Ireland begins to create more urgent, brave, ambitious work that interrogates misogyny and gender imbalance, mainstreaming this practice of staged violence against women is one thing that I would like to spare Irish theatre. When I left this country 16 years ago, I never imagined that I would be invited back to perform in my national theatre. And more shockingly, that I would ever feel that I had the right to call the Abbey my national theatre. It has taken a Welshman and a Scotsman to give exiles like me that gift of our national theatre, not only in our vocabulary, but also in the republic of our imaginations. Last year, I was asked how I felt about taking a break from Becca to do some normal theatre. I said I found it hard to let go of a landscape so vast. One of the great gifts of Beckett's Not I is the joy of having your body removed. As a woman, this is just so damn liberating. I got to play consciousness itself. I got to tour the world with only my lips exposed and fill theatres with just my own honest human sound. A far cry from the constantly regurgitated roles of the bitch, the bimbo, the psychos we are all continually subjected to. It took another exile like Beckett to get me to peer past these wounds and into my own potential, to peel away the trappings and the entrapment of a woman, of internalized misogyny, of what society does to us as women, and go beyond the limitations we set ourselves. When the younger generation turned to the arts to seek solace from a ranting, orange, misogynistic despot, we can offer them honest portraits of ourselves in all of our bravery, resourcefulness, power, poetry, intelligence, slices of our defiance to fire the minds and expose them to their true selves. We cannot rewrite history. Our call to mind all of the women who have been written out of it. But we can expand the future. And we can begin that today, here, where everything begins in the republic of our imagination. I'm reading on behalf of Emma Donoghue. I'm happy to be one of a chorus of voices from around the world congratulating Waking the Feminists on its extraordinary year of action. I got my start in theatre in the most amazingly nourishing context, 
I had my first two plays put on in the mid-1990s by an Irish company, Glasshouse Productions, who were committed to theatre by and about women. I owe that launch pad to someone I first met in the women's group in UCD, the inexhaustible Caroline Williams. And I'm so proud that she's part of Waking the Feminists now. As two decades have gone by, I've come to see how lucky I was to get that great start, given how hard it is for so many women to access the institutional and financial resources they need to bring their theatre work to the audiences who need to experience it. Waking the Feminists has done so much more than it was set up to do. This well-run, effective, smart, and moving arts campaign has, a, ha, has had an impact way beyond the Abbey Theatre, way beyond Irish theatre, and way beyond theatre. It manages to combine cool-headed research and urgent testimony, insightful analysis, and passionate solidarity. It's put gender issues in a year-long spotlight and incidentally, managed to make the word feminist hip again. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I met my wife doing a play in Manchester. The cast consisted of 18 men and two women. It was a play about war, and the production featured machine guns and explosions and lots of men screaming and shouting at each other. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> it wasn't until many months later that my wife admitted it had not always been an easy experience. She told me, you have no idea how hard it is to be heard in such a masculine environment. I laughed it off at the time and teased her for not being tough enough. But over the years it became clearer and clearer to me that acting is a different profession for women. Besides the visible imbalances in terms of pay and available roles, the focus on aging and weight lost or gained, there are a myriad of subtle ways that women in rehearsal rooms and on film sets are made, deliberately or otherwise, made, made to feel less than. Once you open your eyes to it, you can see it everywhere. And when you realize it deeply, profoundly affects not only those you love the most, but also colleagues who inspire you and made you want to become an artist in the first place, it is shameful if you don't, at the very least, add your voice to the call for change. The one thing I have resolved to do is to strive to be active in support, rather than simply standing on the sidelines playing lip service to an ideal. Uh, to be more educated about the intricacies of gender inequality, and to use that knowledge to play a part in making real change happen. Thank you. I've been, <laughs> I've, been, I've been told to ask if we could not clap for so long because apparently we're running out of time. <laughs> What a privilege it is to stand on this stage and be heard, to know you're taking part in history, to have ears ready and waiting to receive your message, to follow in the footsteps of artists, revolutionaries, sometimes one and the same. This privilege should not be gendered. It's right that we be grateful when given such a platform. What we should not be is surprised. When tradition is challenged, the absence of truth it sometimes hides becomes exposed, unflattering, maybe even harsh, but once truth has been revealed, it can no longer go unseen. It is not comfortable, it's not gentle, but it is necessary. How things have been doesn't have to be how things are, not if we say they aren't. Women aren't supposed to reveal too much. It has traditionally been considered indecent. But this year, we told our stories, raised our voices, it is our revolution, and despite what the world might tell us this week, we are unstoppable. What power we have when we work together. What a glorious noise we make in unison. What resistance we create when we push back. But even so, we are not the side dish, not the afterthought. We are the flesh and bones and skin of this island. 
We are the main event. Now let us shine. Hello, everyone. This has been an extraordinary year of personal and professional development. I've learned so much. Learning is one of the chief reasons why I love theatre and why I work in theatre. We are always learning. This year, I learned to look harder, to better see my own bias, to recognise the conditioning that has informed my idea of what makes good theatre. I learned to call out misogyny. It's still hard. I was raised to behave like a good girl. I learned that we need to make a plan if we want to affect change. But the crucial thing I learned, the one thing, and this is with apologies to my mum, who has long since been a proponent of the little red hen approach, that is to say, I shall just do it myself. <laughs> the one thing is that it's basically easier if we're all doing it together, if we look harder together, if we call things out together, if we make a plan together, you might get overwhelmed otherwise. And it's not that I didn't know that already. Collaboration is the root of our art form at its best. I knew already that it was possible to have some limited impact with the will of a brilliant organization like the Everman in Cork, we've been committed to producing plays with a majority female cast since 2014. A small step, but a step forward. Last November, Waking the Feminists blew the winds of change through doors nationwide, and suddenly, the potential for greater, longer-lasting impact became possible. I feel enabled now to do things I had only hoped for before as a programmer, producer, and maker because we took stock, redoubled our efforts, and reimagined the Irish theatre landscape together. Thank you. Hi all, I'm so sorry I can't be there today, um, but I wanted to say um, congratulations to all of us for the um, progress that we've made this year. Um, uh, in putting us in our rightful place, front and centre, in the arts and beyond. Uh, Waking the Feminist has created a tidal wave of solidarity and caused such a ruckus, one of which I am so beyond proud to be a part of. So my one thing more that I have been struck by this year is the power of us together. Um, when we stand shoulder to shoulder for our mutual good, when we share our experiences, find identification and empower each other, to speak up and demand change when we get behind each other, hold each other up and cheer each other on. That is how we progress. We still have a ways to go, but we are on the right road. Massive love to all of you and... Uh... I'm glad to be here again and to, to be speaking at another Waking the Feminists event. As the leader of an organisation, the movement has had an interesting, complicated impact on me and the organisation I'm representing on this stage today. I deeply believe in the core values that Waking the Feminists has communicated, and I am committed to advocating for change. At the same time, I recognise the challenges and complexities involved. There is a sense, and I know I'm not alone in feeling this, that the leaders of institutions have been asked to speak today not only because we can and should be instrumental in the change process, but also because we're being called on to be accountable for our positions. It is important that the reasons we, as institutions, stand, the important, excuse me, it is important that the reasons we, as institutions, stand here are not tokenistic. Project is a unique organization in that we actually have less of an issue with gender balance than others when you take into account all of the art forms we present. But that does not mean we can rest on our laurels. As we move into 2017, as Project enters its sixth decade, the one thing that will be central to our work will be to ensure that our program embraces equality and diversity in all its forms, for the organization, the artists we support, and the audiences who come to see the work. The board and I have committed this to paper in our new artistic strategy, and I look forward to sharing it with the wider community in the coming months.
It's January 2051. Three women are to be inaugurated president. They got to know each other in 2015 on Twitter after they noticed a hashtag, Waking the Feminists. <laughs> Donya Zaki is 60 and is about to become Egypt's first woman president. She's also openly bisexual and a poet, the perfect antidote to decades of hypermasculine Egyptian politics. Donya had enthusiastically joined the 2011 revolution, but was frustrated with how quickly it turned into a political musical chairs between the military and the Muslim Brotherhood and how quickly women are erased from revolution. In 2015, she joined an underground anarcho-feminist movement called Sekhmet Sisters. Sekhmet was an ancient Egyptian goddess of retribution and sex. As Donya described her, first she'd kick your head in, then she'd fuck your brains out. <laughs> Arij Mohammed, 55, is about to become Saudi Arabia's first woman mufti. She was an atheist but had agreed to accept the post of first woman mufti because she understood the unholy alliance between men of religion and men of politics. In her 20s, she formed a radical feminist brigade which blossomed into the first feminist revolution to overthrow a regime. Their chant, stay out of my vagina unless I want you in there, quickly turned global. <laughs> Octavia Hernandez, 53, is about to become the third consecutive woman president of the US. Having just beaten Chelsea Clinton, who at 70 was considered too old. Why so many women presidents? Because in 2016, her fellow Americans had elected a fascist, a racist, a misogynist, bigoted sexual predator called Donald Trump. Donia fought the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Octavia fought the US white Christian Brotherhood, which considered women walking incubators. She was enraged that 53% of white women voted for Trump. Asked, why do women fight feminism? Octavia, Octavia would, quote, would quote Octavia Butler, the science fiction fantasy writer she was named after. Drowning people sometimes die fighting their rescuers. At their inauguration, Donia, Arij, and Octavia took an oath to do one thing, fuck the patriarchy. My name is Molly O'Cahan and I'm a theatre designer. I'm here to represent Rough Magic as one of five artists on their Seeds programme. First, I'd like to read to you the company's commitments to further improving gender equality. Rough Magic commits to creating a safe space so all artists can take artistic risks. To sustaining our policy of gender parity in commissioning writers. To achieving gender parity on the board. To inter interrogating artistic choices through systematic checks to formalizing our practice of gender equality in employment opportunity and remuneration for all theatre makers, and to placing women at the heart of the national narrative. The first year of Waking the Feminists has coincided with our first year as Seeds artists. We are changing, learning and growing as artists, as Irish theatre is changing, learning and growing as feminists. This means that gender equality has been a constant subject in our weekly meetings. Recently, we talked about safe spaces. A safe space is any space where you know that if you speak out, you will be supported. Speaking out can be scary, but you have the opportunity to make a space safe for someone else by standing up and making yourself heard. Because if nobody knows that you care, then arguably you don't. We realize that today we feel more confident in speaking out against gender-based discrimination in our workplaces because the likelihood that we will be heard and supported is significantly greater than it was a year ago. But we also realize that there are still moments when not causing a fuss or just getting on with it or feeling like I don't have time for feminism right now, we've a get in to do, gets the better of us. And so we are committed to speaking out loudly and visibly and to making sure that that never feels like a crazy or stupid or humorless thing for the people around us to do, so that we can all always have time for feminism. <laughs> if you ask me what I came to do in this world, I, an artist, will answer you. I am here to live out loud. 
These words by the French writer Emile Zola have been a touchstone. I have reflected and still continue to reflect on the honor of being appointed the new director of the beautiful, iconic, and the much-loved Gate Theater. By looking back at the past, you can understand the present or where you find yourself now, and only then can you look to the future. Over the last few months, I have thought of all the people who have inspired, nurtured, and supported me over the years, both personally and professionally. A common thread appears, that those who have made the biggest and most lasting impact are women. And many of these women have been pioneers, telling stories from an outsider's perspective and living their lives on the margins and peripheries. They have forged a different pathway, creating their own rules, leading by example and through collaboration, and taken risks. These are women who have stirred things up and who have questioned and challenged, despite doors being closed and gates being bolted. As a result, things are now changing and need to continue to change. And their example has empowered, encouraged, and inspired me to be bolder and braver. And it has made me realize I am not alone. These inspiring role models have pushed me out of my comfort zone and made me believe it is possible to think big and live out loud. These fearless women gave me the confidence to follow in their footsteps and to be an outsider on my journey in search of a new creative home. And one thing more, let's be fearless in our quest for change. Thank you. In May 2016, the National Concert Hall announced its centenary festival program, Composing the Island. Of the living composers represented, there were 13 women and 37 men. Of all the pieces played, written by living composers, 19 were by women, 70 were by men. To put this into perspective, over the three weeks, audiences listened to a total of 870 minutes of music written by men, and just 197 minutes of music written by women. When this imbalance was first pointed out, the NCH responded, we cannot rewrite history. And added, happily, due to the huge strides being made addressing gender imbalance, a retrospective of the 21st century will look very different. Not only is this dismissive and condescending, I feel like I need to point out we are nearly 17 years into the 21st century. The role of a national cultural institution has always been about setting the standard of contemporary art. It writes history by imposing the standard of what is recognized as a good piece of work and what isn't. Its pro programming decisions determine such. We Cannot Rewrite History is a curious comment from an institution that actively writes the narrative into its record books of what is and what is not of standard. The canon was established by men, and this is the antiquated patriarchal standard that we are still expected to submit to if our work is to have an outlet here. The landscape of contemporary Irish music is rich with the work of female artists, yet the programming predicts the future of Irish contemporary music to be predominantly male. It is time to step in and not leave our future in these hands. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to voice my support for Waking the Feminists. I am proud to be a part of such a mutually respectful, nourishing, inclusive and challenging movement. We become the stories we hear and tell ourselves. I am hungry for stories that open my heart and mind. I am hungry to be fed stories from and about my sex told by women that challenge the sick thought systems the world has in place. I am in America. Donald Trump has been elected president. He speaks with vulgarity about women. He objectifies us. What does it mean that America is prepared to accept a person who demeans women and people of other backgrounds and beliefs? Who has urged us to build walls, lock her up, grab her pussy, indulge in locker room talk? What story are they telling themselves in America? Why is, what is it trying to force us to tell ourselves? 
Hillary Clinton spoke of her disappointment at not shattering the highest and hardest glass ceiling. She reminded us that someday, someone will, and that that woman may be amongst us now. She urged younger people to never stop believing that fighting for what is right is worth it. And she directly addressed little girls to never doubt that they are valuable and powerful and deserving of every opportunity in the world to pursue and achieve their own dreams. She stated that our best days are ahead of us. This is the story I will reach towards, the story I will nourish and support, the dream I choose to follow. Thank you to Leon Bell for having the courage to act on this wild, impulsive and outraged wisdom that sparked Waking the Feminists and this feminist's awakening. I have worked in the arts for 30 years as a producer and company venue and general manager. I remember when Waking the Feminist kicked off. I'd been working in Drogheda for 13 years, but things hadn't worked out quite as I had expected, so I was faced with searching for a new role for the first time in a long, long time. I thought, at my age, nobody is going to hire me, but Dublin Theatre Festival did. I remember feeling so grateful at the time, and it took me a while to remember they hired me because I am good. I was reminded of this reading Gráinne Pollock's MA thesis. There was a quote from one of the interviewees. Men walk into an interview and say that they can do this. Women apologise and hold back. This sense that I did hold back. I didn't go for more jobs whilst my male contemporaries just went for it. Even when Willie asked me to speak here today, my first reaction was, it's on the Abbey stage, let me think. We joked that a man would just say yes and dive in. At Dublin Theatre Festival, Waken the Feminist has been on the agenda all year, at board level and at staff level. We discuss it regularly at our company meetings. We have realised that it's not enough for our team to believe in gender equality. It has to become institutionalised. We have reviewed statements on equality and respect in our handbooks so that the values of gender equality radiate beyond the core team to everyone we engage professionally. In 2017, we will undertake unconscious bias training together as a team. Our board, which is already gender balanced, has embraced this as a policy. We are continuing to count and to reflect on how there can be more progression of women theatre practitioners and arts managers so that there will be equality of opportunity in all the roles in the performing arts in Ireland. Finally, waking the feminist means for all those young women in the sector, we will all help you, mentor you and foster and develop your talent. To all those women in the sector who are my age or close to my age, who have fallen through the gap, come back. Let us all further develop the talent of our generation. Women my age make up a significant proportion of the theatre-going audience. So I want to see stories on stage about me. Not just stories about the menopause or midlife crisis, but real stories for me. Thank you. Every day in advertising, the most amazing perceptions are created. Advertising people can make it seem cool to smoke. They can make it seem cool to stop smoking. They can make it seem sophisticated to drink or to, or to stop drinking. They can even make it seem like a good idea to fly Ryanair. <laughs> the reality for women in the advertising industry is that we make up just 18% of those at CEO and managing director level. Creative roles are generally about 70% male to 30% female. When it comes to how women see their role in advertising, we've been working hard to change perceptions. One thing we've done is to create the annual Doyen Award to shine a light on rising female talent. We've proactively appointed women to the boards of the industry committees. We've published the fact that there's been a 6% increase in women taking up senior roles. I believe we must know the stats to change them. It's hard to argue when you have the evidence. 
And yet, if you ask most women in advertising if there's equality, they will say no. The perception remains poor. We need more women in senior creative roles in ad agencies to help tell the story. I hope that with more women in the creative departments, the output of our industry will change. There will be less gender stereotyping. But to be frank, I'm not sure if it will. If we reach a tipping point of more female art directors, copywriters and creative directors, will this change the work itself? Will we challenge existing norms? We'll see. In keeping with the celebratory, celebratory tone of this morning's gathering, I want to tell you about one thing that happened for me and the Defence Forces in this very special centenary year of 2016. On the 7th of July, I was promoted to the rank of Colonel and thereby became the highest ranking female and the first female Colonel in the history of the Defence Forces. This month marks my 35th anniversary of joining the Defence Forces, so it was an overnight success. <laughs> I joined a cadet class of six women and 43 men, where our training was entirely integrated. However, at the time, females were considered non-combatant and therefore restricted in the appointments they could, home, could hold at home and overseas. By 1992, however, the non-combatant policy was withdrawn and the Defence Forces is now committed to equality of opportunity in all aspects of military life, including appointments that women and men can hold. As a consequence, I have been, I've held appointments in operations, training and strategic planning. I've served overseas on seven different occasions. I've served in Lebanon three times, Western Sahara, East Timor, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Chad. I was the first female to be appointed as an infantry battalion commander, something I'm extremely proud of. One thing I have learned from my 35 years of service with the Defence Forces is that if you work hard on a level playing field provided by robust equality policies, you can achieve whatever you set out to achieve. One final thing, as a result of these equality policies, I know there is no, absolutely no reason why I, as a woman, cannot, cannot envisage future celebrations for further promotions in years to come. Thank you. What we have done in Fringe since Waking the Feminists began, we've self-assessed and spoken up Looking hard at the representation of women in Irish performing arts is now a constant on Fringe's agenda. At the same time, we're watching representation of race, of culture, of ethnicity, of artists with disability and of class. We've also advocated for the inclusion of gender identities other than male and female in all of our conversations about equality. This includes trans, questioning, intergender, non-binary and other gender identities. We are keeping track. At Fringe, projects are led by artists of all disciplines. We are identifying and implementing a way of record keeping and counting gender diversity that truly and accurately reflects how we interact with creative leaders, artists, curators, impresarios, producers and directors across every aspect of what we do. We have declared our intentions. We've made the implicit Fringe is for everyone's spirit explicit. We've stated our commitment to equality and diversity in our call out for applications and formalised it as an important criteria for festival programming. We are advancing in every way we can. So what's our one more thing? It's a rallying call, a continued rallying call. To all radicals, visionaries, dreamers, rebels, newbies and big mouths of all gender identities, race, class and background, you are welcome at Fringe. We want your outrageous, we want your clarion calls, your shimmering visions, your artistic excellence, your nasty and your cold hard truths. We will amplify your voices, we will spotlight you on our stages and we will help you to make your mark. <laughs>